invite him to address the assembly, Mr. President. Honorable President, distinguished heads of states and governments, distinguished Secretary General, esteemed delegates, I would like to salute you all with my most heartfelt emotions on behalf of my personal self and my nation. I would like to thank Ms. Espinosa for her successful work over the past year. I also wholeheartedly congratulate Mr. Mohamed Bande, who has taken over the presidency of the General Assembly for the 74th session. And I hope and pray that the 74th session of the GA will bring peace and prosperity to the whole world and humanity. Esteemed delegates, our world today faces many challenges and pain resulting from injustice at a global scale. The great scholar of our civilization, Rumi, has once defined justice as the following, quote, sharing amongst the people the rights and obligations appropriately and allocating to them what they are entitled to. It is obvious that today neither the rights nor the responsibilities are shared appropriately. In the meantime, injustice generates instability, power struggles, crises, waste, and extravagance. Yet, the organization where we're gathered today was established in the aftermath of the Second World War with the eventual purpose of eradicating injustice. Indeed, the international community is gradually losing its ability to find lasting solutions to challenges such as terrorism, hunger, misery, and climate change, which all threaten our own future. It is with no doubt that the General Assembly has a very fitting theme for the 74th session, galvanizing multilateral efforts for poverty eradication, quality education, climate action, and inclusion. But what's more important than that is to understand what we can achieve together. It is unacceptable to see that one part of the world lives in luxury and enjoys benefit of prosperity, while people in other parts of the world suffer in the hands of poverty, misery, and illiteracy. It is painful to see that a fortunate minority in the world are discussing issues such as digital technology, robotics, artificial intelligence, and obesity, whereas more than 2 billion people live under the poverty line and 1 billion people suffer from hunger. We cannot turn our back to the reality that if all of us are not safe, none of us will be safe. For many years I have been saying from this rostrum that we cannot leave the fate of humanity up to the discretion of a handful of countries. Today, I would like to reiterate, reiterate once again that the world is greater than five. It is night time that we change our current mentality, our institutions, organizations, and rules. The inequality between nuclear states and non-nuclear states is alone enough to undermine global balances. It bothers us, like anyone else, that the weapons of mass destruction are used as leverage in every crisis instead of their total elimination. The possession of nuclear power should either be forbidden for all or permissible for everyone. For the sake of a peaceful future for all humanity, 
Let us solve this problem as soon as possible on the basis of justice. At a time when, e when 13 people lose their lives due to air pollution every minute and where global warming threatens our own future, we cannot remain indifferent in the face of such challenges. First and foremost, we need to strengthen the United Nations' potential and efficiency. In particular, we should carry out at once the much-needed fundamental reforms in line with the principles of justice and equality within the Security Council. With an active, with a proactive and a humane foreign policy, Turkey embraces the entire the rest of the world and strives to find just justice-based solutions to our problems. It is not without a reason that Turkey has earned the titles of the most generous country in terms of humanitarian aid, as well as the country hosting the largest displaced persons in the world. The third African Union-Turkey Partnership Summit to be held in Turkey in 2020 will constitute another concrete example of our dedication and our proactive humane policy. I invite all the countries present under this roof to support our policies and initiatives, which we have formulated on the basis of justice, ethics, and conscience. Esteemed delegates, today Syria has become a place that hurts the most collective conscience of humanity, and it has become a symbol of injustice. Since 2011, the regime and the terrorist organizations, as well as the forces encouraging them, insistently pursue a policy of perpetual crisis. Almost one million people were killed and 12 million people were displaced. And how of that population were forced to live elsewhere. And the Syrian crisis has to be ended once and for all. Turkey is the country that has been mostly affected as a result of the imposition of Daesh threat. This terrorist organization has harassed our borders and targeted the very heart of our cities near the borders with suicide bombings, which have killed hundreds of Turkish citizens. Turkey is the country who has inflicted the first and the heaviest blow to the Daesh presence in Syria. With the Operation Euphrates Shield, we have neutralized approximately 3,500 Daesh terrorists and we have paved the way to the collapse of this terrorist organization in Syria. We are also at the forefront of international efforts to identify terrorists and foreign fighters coming from all over the world to join Daesh through imposition of entry bans and deportations to and from our country. On the other hand, Turkey today is the most generous country in terms of humanitarian aid, taking into consideration the ratio of Turkish official humanitarian assistance to its GDP. We are currently hosting 5 million refugees fleeing conflict, starvation and persecution. In other words, there are more asylum seekers in Turkey than the total population of 29 states in the United States. 3.6 million asylum seekers in our country are mainly from Syria. I mean, the number of the Syrian brothers and sisters that we are currently hosting in our country well exceeds half of the total population of NYC. We've spent $40 million for the asylum seekers in the last eight years. But have we received anything as Turkey? Let me tell you. From the EU, we have until so far received not directly into our national budget, by the way, just through international organizations, which was allocated to Disaster Relief Agency of Turkey and the Turkish Red Crescent, not, much, not more than 3 billion euros. 365,000 of the asylum seekers who fled to our country safely returned to the areas we have secured in Syria, such as cities of Cerablus and 
elsewhere. Nearly half of Syri Syrian refugees are under the age of 18. The number of the Syrian children born, born on our territory reached 500,000. We're not only providing accommodation to them, but also essential services such as education and health care. Unfortunately, the world and the international community is too quick to forget the survival journey that they have embarked upon ending in the dark waters of the Mediterranean Sea or against the security fences stretching along the borders that they're trying to flee. As you can see, this is the picture of baby Ailan that was beached, which was a long time ago, and it's been forgotten already. No, never forget that this can happen to you, because baby Ailans, there are many baby Ailans, there are thousands of millions of baby Ailans that we need to take measures for. This is a responsibility that we have to rise up to. Only within the first eight months of this year, we have received 32,000 irregular migrants and saved them from drowning at sea. Also, during the first eight months of this year, we have spent 58,000 irregular migrants back to their countries, excluding Syrians. And with those fleeing from other parts of the world, Turkey currently hosts 5 million oppressed and victimized people on its soil. Unfortunately, we were left alone in our selfless sacrifice towards asylum seekers. In Syria, there has been no genuine return to the regions controlled by the regime and the terrorist organizations such as PKK, YPG, and Daesh. The parts liberated and secured by Turkey are the only places that the Syrians could have returned to. Today, we face three important issues that we need to handle while we're trying to settle the humanitarian crisis in Syria. Number one, the territorial integrity and the political unity of Syria. And in order for that to be possible, the Constitutional Committee is a very critical element and it has to be operational in a very effective manner. The beginning of last week, we got together along with my Iranian and Russian counterparts in Ankara and as a result of the Russian summit memorandum, we've managed to accomplish a significant majority of our targets. When we reach a permanent political solution in Syria, the territorial integrity will be restored once again. And the second important issue is, is the following. We need to do everything that is possible in order to prevent a possible massacre in the city of Idlib and an immigration influx consisting of 4 million individuals from Idlib. The agreement, the memorandum we reached in Russia, in, with Russia in Sochi, still remains valid despite some setbacks. Turkey cannot afford to bear another migration influx. That's why we expect all countries around the world to support Turkey's efforts to ensure security and stability in Idlib. Thirdly, the elimination of PKK and YPG terrorist organizations in the east of the Euphrates which occupy a quarter of Syria and tries to legitimize itself under the name of the so-called Syrian Democratic Forces. We will not be able to find a permanent solution to the Syrian conflict if we fail to handle all the terrorist organizations with the same perspective. Our talks with the United States with a view of establishing a safe zone in Syria continue. We intend to establish a peace corridor with a depth of 30 kilometers and the length of 480 kilometers in Syria and enable the settlement of 2 million Syrians there with the support of the international community. Here I'd like to show you a map briefing our plans. This is the border of Turkey that you can see and below you can see the proposed safe zone. If this safe zone, the secure zone can be declared, we can resettle confidently 
somewhere between 1 million to 2 million refugees. We can afford that opportunity. Whether the United States or the coalition forces, Russia, Iran, we can all together walk shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand. The refugees can be resettled through saving them from tent camps or container camps. We can take the steps that are necessary forward altogether. This is not a burden that we can bear exclusively as the Republic of Turkey. We need to take the necessary measures as soon as possible. If we could extend the depth of this region until Deir ez-Zor, Raqqa line, we can increase the number of Syrians up to 3 million who will return from Turkey, Europe, and other parts of the world to their motherland. We are very much resolute in the realizing of this program and we are involved in the necessary preparations. We also lead a process for an international conference to be held with the participation of Lebanon, Iraq and Jordan. We likewise attach a great significance to the prospective success of the Global Refugee Forum to be held in Geneva in December, co-chaired by Turkey. We are of the opinion that a donor conference can be organized under the leadership of the United Nations to support returns to safe areas. There is global need for effective implementation of the Global Compact for Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees adopted last year at the United Nations. If we succeed to establish an environment, a landscape of trust and stability on the basis of the principles of legitimacy and justice in Syria, we will also help neighboring Iraq relieve itself from her troubles related to both Daesh and PKK presence. I launch an appeal to the entire UN family from this hall to take initiatives as well as to support our ongoing efforts to stop the humanitarian crisis in Syria. Esteemed delegates, the Mediterranean Basin, in addition to the tragedies triggered by the Syrian crisis, such as illegal migration, faces further problems due to developments in the Eastern Mediterranean. Despite negotiations of more than five decades, the Cyprus question has not yet been resolved due to the uncompromising position of the Greek Cypriots. The Greek Cypriot side pursues an inequitable and an unjust policy of imposition that refuses to share the political power and prosperity with the Turkish Cypriots. Turkey is the international treaty-based guarantor of the Turkish Cypriot people, with whom it has deep historical and cultural bonds. Similarly, Greece is a guarantor and the UK is a guarantor. It is clear that those who claim to solve the Cyprus problem under the condition of zero security, zero guarantee, have ill intentions from the, f from the onset. As Turkey, we will continue our efforts until a solution that would guarantee the security and the preservation of the rights of the Turkish Cypriots are, is found. Excuse me. We believe that the energy resources in the Eastern Mediterranean constitute an important opportunity for cooperation if we all adopt a win-win approach. But unfortunately, despite our reasonable approach, some countries of the region, through unilateral steps, are trying to turn the issue of energy resources into a scope of conflict. In the Eastern Mediterranean, we are determined to protect the legitimate rights and interests of both Turkey and the Turkish Cypriots until the very end. We will continue to be open-minded about proposals based on cooperation and equitable sharing. Another critical area of the Mediterranean is Libya, and we endeavor to ensure security and stability in the country through the establishment of a democratic administration based on the free will of people. The political and economic empowerment of Libya will be providing a relief for both North Africa and Europe. The solution in this country can be explored by only respecting the choices and the free will of the Libyan people. Interventions in Yemen and Qatar 
have had serious consequences from a both humanitarian and economic point of view. We should all seek an immediate settlement of the disputes in the region that re-emerged due to the attacks on oil production facilities. Journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who was brutally, brutally slaughtered last year, has become a symbol for the need of justice and equality in the region as the courts have not reached yet a verdict regarding his demise. And we will keep on following up the developments there as we are so much committed to this case. And Egypt's first democratically elected president, Mohamed Mursi, who lost his life in a courtroom in a suspicious way, is another issue that we're heavily invested in and his family was not allowed to bury him properly. It's a bleeding wound in our hearts. They have both become a deep symbol for the need to equality and justice in the region. We also hope that the discussions about Iran's activities as well as, as well as related threats to this country will be resolved in a rational framework. Esteemed delegates, today the Palestinian territory under, under Israeli occupation have become one of the most striking places of injustice. If the images of an innocent Palestinian woman who was murdered heinously by Israeli security forces on the street just a few days ago will not awake the global conscience, then we are standing at a point where words are not sufficient. I'm quite curious. What about this map of Israel? Where is Israel? Where does the land of Israel begin and end? Look at this map. Where was Israel in 1947? And where is Israel now? Especially between the years 1949 and 1967. Where was Israel and where is Israel now? Look. This is 1947, the land of Palestine. There is seemingly almost no Israeli presence on these lands. The entire territory belongs to the Palestinians, so the map suggests. But the year 1947, the uh, distribution plan takes place, gets ratified, Palestine, Palestinian lands start shrinking, and Israel starts expanding. And from 1947 to 1967, 1967, Israel is still expanding, Palestine is still shrinking. And today, the current situation, there is seemingly no Palestinian presence. The entire land belongs to Israel. But would it suffice Israel? No. Israel is still willing to take over the remaining of the land. But what about the United Nations Security Council? What about the United Nations? And what about the resolutions therein? Are those resolutions being activated? Are they being implemented and enforced? No. So we have to ask ourselves, what does the UN serve? Under this roof, we are producing resolutions without any effect. So when do you think or where do you think justice can prevail? This is our main suffering. This is where the pain is coming from. The current Israeli government and the administration right next to these murders and atrocities is busy with intervening and attacking the historical legal status of Jerusalem and holy sacred lands and artifacts. As Turkey, we have a very clear stance on this issue. The immediate establishment of an independent Palestinian state with homogenous territories on the basis of the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital is the only solution. Any other peace plan other than this will never have a chance of being fair, just, and it will never be implemented. 
Now, I'm asking from the rostrum of the United Nations General Assembly, where are the borders of the State of Israel? Is it the 1947 borders? The 90, 1967 borders? Or is there another border that we need to know of? How can the Golan Heights and the West Bank settlements be seized, just like other occupied Palestinian territories before the eyes of the world, if they still are not within the official borders of this state? Is the aim of the initiative promoted as the deal of the century to entirely eliminate the presence of the state and the people of Palestine? Do you want another bloodshed? All actors of the international community, in particular the UN, should provide concrete support to the Palestinian people beyond more promises. In this regard, it's very important for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees in the Near East to continue its activities effectively. Turkey will continue to stand by the oppressed people of Palestine as she has always been done. It is also very important for a fair and a peaceful future that the South Caucasus ceases to be one of the areas of conflict and tension in the world. It is unacceptable that Nagorno-Karabakh and its surrounding areas which are the Azerbaijani territories are still occupied despite all of the resolutions adopted One of the problems to which the international community fails to devote enough attention is the Kashmiri conflict awaiting a solution for 72 years. The stability and prosperity of South Asia cannot be separated from the Kashmiri issue. Despite the resolutions adopted by the United Nations Security Council, Kashmir is still besieged and 8 million people are still stuck in Kashmiri. They cannot get out. In order for the Kashmiri people to look towards a safe future with their Pakistani and Indian neighbors, it is imperative to solve this problem through dialogue on the basis of justice and equality instead of conflict. Another issue that the world seems to remain indifferent is the humanitarian tragedy Rohingya Muslims are currently facing. The Independent Commission of Inquiry established under the United Nations has recorded the existence of a genocidal intent behind the events perpetrated in Myanmar's Rakhine State. Turkey will continue to carry out its initiatives and endeavors to ensure the security and fundamental rights of the Rohingyas as well as the humanitarian relief activities we have undertaken since the first day. The invasions, the conflicts and terrorist activities that continued in an uninterrupted fashion for almost four decades in Afghanistan have led to significant challenges at a global level. It is night time for peace and security to, be, security to be restored. This is up to us to assume responsibility and take up action. Esteemed delegates, today one of the biggest threats to global peace and stability is the skyrocketing racist, xenophobic, discriminatory and anti-Islamic rhetoric. Muslims are ranking number one who's who are the subjects of hate speech, discrimination, and defamation against their sacred values. The most striking example is the terrorist attack that took place last March in Christchurch in New Zealand. Just like the terrorist, terrorist attack targeting Muslims in New Zealand was unacceptable, the acts of terrorism targeting Christians in Sri Lanka and Jewish communities in the United States are equally wrong and unacceptable. We are responsible for turning this disease into a raging insanity. The populist politicians seeking to garner votes by provoking these 
tendencies, as well as the communities normalizing hate speech under the pretext of freedom of expression, are in the leading spots, and they are the ones to blame. The prejudice, the ignorance and bigotry, as well as the attempts of marginalization towards the migrants, particularly the Muslims, pave the way for the rising of these morbid tendencies. This scourge can only be defeated by common will and efforts. It is our fundamental duty as statesmen and stateswomen to adopt an inclusive and tolerant public rhetoric to eradicate this foe once and for all. The Honorable Secretary General of the UN has recently introduced an action plan for safeguarding religious sites. It's a UN initiative in the establishment of which Turkey has shown political leadership as a part of Alliance of Civilizations. We hope that this action plan will help raise awareness on this issue. And I hereby request the designation of March the 15th by the United Nations as the day when the Christchurch attack was carried out to become the International Day for Solidarity Against Islamophobia. I also invite the Islamic world to start a thorough assessment of all the issues, particularly the Sunni-Shia divide, which have provided so far the ground for its internal conflicts, as well as, as well, which served as political instruments for power struggles and settle the disputes once and for all. Turkey is a rightful successor to the collective heritage of both Eastern and Western civilizations due to our geographical location at the center of the ancient world. There, therefore, we are obliged to take necessary steps forward and assume responsibility and rise up to the occasion. We continue to fulfill our responsibilities towards humanity as we are deeply affected indirectly or directly as a result of crises that besiege our region. A United Nations, and in particular a Security Council, reformed on the basis of justice, moral values and conscience, will provide hope and aspiration to humanity once again. Turkey stands ready to support all of the endeavors and initiatives in that regard. With this understanding, we are willing to assume the presidency of the 75th United Nations General Assembly. Therefore, we have nominated for this important post Ambassador Volkan Bosker, former Minister of European Union and current Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. We have full confidence that Mr. Bosker, a seasoned diplomat and politician, will shoulder this responsibility very successfully. I believe you will not spare your support to him. I, I, Istanbul, the biggest city in Turkey, currently hosts various UN regional agencies, and we would like to turn Istanbul into a bigger regional and a global hub for the United Nations. The United Nations Technology Bank for the Least Developed Countries became operational in the vicinity of Istanbul last year. We also appreciate the positive and encouraging reactions we have received in return for our proposal to host a United Nations Youth Center in Istanbul, which I have announced last year from this very rostrum. The members to the UN Group of Friends of Mediation that we co-chair have reached 59. We have carried this UN, initi UN initiative into the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. I believe that it is within our reach to find fair equitable and conscientious solutions to all of the global challenges that we face. And I would like to conclude my remarks with the following wishes. Freedom for all, peace for all, prosperity for all, justice for all, a peaceful and a safe future for all. I wish the work of the 74th session of the UNGA to be successful. I greet you all with my most heartfelt emotions, with love and respect on behalf of my people. Thank you.